This video is sponsored by DJ the Lazy Gamer, Zach Haji, and Zachary Hayes. Hello, what is up to you members of the Plus Ultra fam and anyone just now stumbling onto this channel? I am known as Plus Ultra Man. After nearly three years of hard work and lots of fun storytelling on this channel, my dream and ambition has reached over 50,000 subscribers. I cannot stress to you all how much this means and what a privilege and honor the journey up until now has been. All I can say is I appreciate you and I intend to only continue to show you all bigger and better stories so as to live up to my namesake. And today is no exception as it is another step forward in that pursuit as we once again expand the series we cover in alternate scenarios and timelines here on Plus Ultra Man. I am of course referring to Echiro Oda's masterpiece manga turned anime turned worldwide phenomenon One Piece. It is a story which has always captured my imagination and now coming off of my first ever full and committed read through of the source material from Romance Dawn to current, I now feel fully confident in attempting alternate timelines and takes on the pirate world. That being said, I'd like to assuage a few fears I think naturally come along with covering a new series no one has ever watched me for and one as big as One Piece. Number one, I'm fully aware One Piece is a long story and it's not for everyone, and so I'll be maintaining a strict policy on overly long stories for the series, as ultimately, I think a lot of changes to the timeline you can make of the story are really significant ones that make interesting changes that people will want to see, while other concepts would inevitably result in dull retellings of familiar events with different flavor texts and maybe slightly different circumstances, and those just are not the kinds of stories I like to tell. Number two, you can have a casual level of knowledge of the series and still enjoy these alternate takes. Like with all my other stories, it's fairly simple to explain canon circumstances for quick recaps, or if new circumstances are being created, it's easy for you to follow along. And number three, because I am now introducing another series I'm open to telling stories about does not in any way threaten any of the stories or series I have spoken about before thus far, nor is it going to have any real effect on my rate of storytelling as I've always made content at my own pace to maintain quality, and I don't intend to leave any series I've done a main title what if story for without some form of cathartic finish. So with all that said, please be sure to like button and comment all your thoughts, as well as being sure you subscribe so you can come along and bring all your hopes and dreams as we are currently on Epic Cruise. On the grand seas of the One Piece world, I have always taken a particular interest in the life of Rob Lucci. For those who don't remember, Lucci was a part of CP9, a covert military organization specially trained to protect the world government interests and pull off flawless infiltration and a lot of the time assassination jobs. At the age of 28, in his debut chapter, Lucci is over 10 years older than our main character, Monkey D. Luffy, and from what we know, he spent the majority of his tender years going through harsh training to master the Roku Shiki, or Six Powers, a superhuman martial art consisting of three movement or evasion skills and three really cool combat skills in the form of Geppo, or Moonwalk, Soru, or Shave, and Kamie, or Paper Art, with the combat ones being Shigan, or Finger Pistol, Tekai, or Iron Body, and Rankiaku, or Tempest Kick. With Luigi actually turning out to be a prodigy in that he mastered and was able to find subforms and mixtures of these abilities in a lot of different and really cool ways. And I should probably also mention now he has this very cool and seemingly immortal pet pigeon named Hattori who a lot of people believe is actually pulling off the strings. His training seemed to instill a very deadly and cold outlook in Luchi though, as his next major action would come when he was around Luffy's age, being sent on a mission when around 13 years old, as he was sent to handle a hostage crisis between pirates and a random nation who had 500 of his soldiers taken hostage. The young Rob Luchi's solution to the issue being to eliminate the 500 hostages, to eliminate the pirates leverage, and then the pirates themselves in the process. Like dude, why, why didn't you just start the pirates? Here we should also mention his teammates. We'll explore them a bit more as we go on, but we have Kaku, the master of four sword style and the wielder of a giraffe zone type devil fruit, Jabra, a master of a special martial art using iron body and owner of a wolf type zone devil fruit, Bluno, another master of the six powers and a door door man who ate the door door fruit, Kumidori, a very dramatic CP9 agent who's a fan of Kabuki, Fukuro, literally the funniest dude alive, and Kalifla who ate the bubble bubble fruit. Anyway, from there, Luchi's time is mostly unaccounted for until he is given a very deep undercover mission in the man-made and world-renowned shipbuilding island, Water 7, where for five years, he was able to join the Galila shipwright. And let me stress, these were the best shipmakers in the world currently. 
Working directly under its leader and the island's mayor, Iceberg, in effort to find the blueprints to a weapon known as Pluton that he was suspected of possessing. This is where the character is officially introduced to us, and where his and the rest of CP9's clash with the Straw Hats and their captain for the remainder of the arc and in his lobby really begins. Summarizing what happens there for the sake of time here, the antagonists struggle against our main characters in a lot of interesting and emotional battles that still remain favorites of mine even to this day when the series has had, admittedly, even better ones. Lucci and his teammates would ultimately be defeated, and due to the incompetence of their very poorly appointed commanding officer, Spandam, the Straw Hats and their allies escape the Navy as a Buster Call, which is a Navy fleet super attack, is called down with the remains of Innie's lobby, resulting in a total victory for our heroes. We then wouldn't hear from Lucci or CP9 for a good while until later during the Impel Down arc, where we are treated to the CP9 Incident Report which are the cover stories spanning from chapters 491 to 528, where we learn with the help of Bluno, CP9 escaped the Buster Call and later went on to use the sea train tracks to travel to a nearby island called St. Poplar, where they all then did odd jobs to afford Rob Lucci a life-saving medical treatment, and later actually go on to defend that island from the Candy Pirates, but it's actually a little overkill. Realizing they can no longer stay on the peaceful island, they steal the pirate ship and take a trip back to where it all started in the island where they were trained. There, they are tracked by the Navy, who has been looking for them since Indy's lobby, likely due to Spondum throwing them under the bus. Though, they pretty easily fight off the troops sent after them before stealing their superior Navy vessel and sailing off into the sunset after giving their former commander a chilling warning. This would again be the last we heard of or saw of Lucci for a good while, and at the time, it very much looked like Lucci would become some form of pirate or an outlaw of some kind, maybe even a revolutionary. But when we do see him again, he is even higher in the covert ranks of the Navy, now being promoted to join an even more secret organization in Cypherpole Ages Zero. And these guys pretty much work directly under the Navy heads to protect the Celestial Dragons. And getting a brand new look in the time skip with all this. What makes this even more mysterious is at the time of recording, nothing has really been revealed about this organization, and we currently only really can account for Rob Lucci and Kaku with all other members of CP9 having not been seen since the last incident report. Lucci has appeared and cameoed in things as of recently, and we know there are CP0 members in Wano interested in the conflict, so it's very likely the information in this video can quickly become outdated. But for right now, we just don't really know much about why Lucci is in this organization, what this organization's goal is, and what happened between him sailing off and him being in this organization. As I should also mention, at this point when he returns, Spondum is actually working under him now. Though, one important part of the incident report I'd like to point out is that during it, Lucci is actually characterized really differently, which is fun as is expanding on a somewhat two-dimensional antagonist we only really got so much time to explore before Luffy and he inevitably had to come to blows. All of CP9 get more development, and it's all kind of communicated to the little things just because Oda is that good with characterization. We learn that Bluno is not only serious and stoic while also seeming to have really bought into the world government propaganda while he spoke about Robin, he's also reliable and really loyal to his allies. When the group escaped the Buster Call, they all had this cute little team meeting where they decide to save Lucci. And look, someone gets Kali for something to cover up after how her fight with Nami ends. That's like a real expression of team camaraderie and like decency. Bluno and Jabba are the ones who knows the Navy is looking for them and you get this sense that they're really disgusted with the world government from Oda's art. And then look here, as they cross the sea train tracks, it's Jopper who made fun of Kaku, and was angry his Doraki was higher than his own, and yet, in this moment where Kaku's hurt, he's the one that's carrying him. And look, both Bluno and Fukuro could have done this. Also, notice in this scene, Jopper is now shirtless, and Caulifla doesn't have that sheet on her anymore, she's wearing his shirt. So for all his being really competitive and wanting to tease his friends, he really is very compassionate and selfless, it seems. Other stuff here too, like look at Kaku tiredly and smugly pointing something out in front of them, while Kumidora presumably sings while he's carrying Luchi. When they get into the city and see how much the doctor's going to cost, Jabra and Fukuro argue over money. Bluno shows a rare smile while he and Jabra perform. Caulifla smokes, and Kumidora and Hattori are apparently close enough to share food. Kaku and Fukuro seem to be good with kids. Oh, and also, Fukuro is doing this while he's obviously still hurt, and he fought Frankie while Kaku fought Zoro and had to be carried, so I'm sure he's also still injured, meaning they were both really motivated to save Luchi. 
I could keep going on and- Oh, Jabra has a sweet tooth and Kaku and Fukuro also seem to get along and teasing him for it. Oh yeah, when they get Luchi out of the hospital and you see all their new fits, somebody went out and bought clothes for each member of the team and knows their style well enough to dress them really, really well. Listen, my point is you should really read the manga at some point and pour over the chapter covers with storylines. They are always absolutely bursting with info and personality and I just, I love them. I'm done rambling though. For us, the mystery of this gap in Luchi's timeline isn't a major disadvantage as we have these chapter covers. And ultimately, we know in canon, Eni's lobby and the loss to Luffy was enough to either shake the world government's faith in Luchi completely or cause a reduction in Luchi's loyalty that would be effective in any major situation just because of how the timeline turned out. A really pertinent example of Luchi's goals and ambitions and kind of the axioms he kind of operates off of is when he literally states them to Spawnum at Eni's lobby. As Spawnum asks him, well what do you want then? He says, quote, blood. While we're here, meaning a part of CP9, murder is permissible. And it's really clear from hearing that, that Luchi really likes and is motivated by fighting and killing. But his wording is interesting. That statement of permitted implies there is a consequence to murder that he recognizes he's avoiding by being in the Navy and that it is his intention to do so. Meaning there's someone he doesn't want to fight. And while he prioritizes bloodshed and being on the side that gets to claim it's dulling out of bloodshed as justice, it seems like avoiding that fight and being on what he perceives as the winning side really is a very strong value of his. And it's really the only explanation you need to understand why he joined CP0 after being betrayed. But as you've read from the title and are no doubt waiting for me to finally get into, we simply want to look at a timeline where this isn't the case. And again, note, this isn't a far-fetched idea. At the time of the final chapter cover, many people actually expected this outcome. Another thing of particular note is that Eni's lobby is a major news event for a while. Granted, it's overshadowed really, really soon afterwards when Luffy goes in to not only infiltrate and then escape the world's strongest prison, right before he and a lot of the world's major powers are involved in a massive war. Nevertheless, even Bartholomew Kuma, a warlord of the sea, noted that there wasn't really a person alive of real note who could have expected Rob Lucci to lose to Luffy. A sentiment I've always found a little bit weird as it's strange for Lucci to be both simultaneously a master of espionage and an assassin, and also world famous to the point of his fighting prowess being known so well Luffy caused an upset. Regardless, that is a statement which clues us into a lot. Namely, that this is another time the young Scarface supernova has really humiliated the Navy. So it is kind of understandable that if Spondum were to pin everything on them, then the government would be so blinded by their anger at the embarrassment that they don't really care to do away with valuable allies as long as someone is punished for the failure. So everyone from then on out would be motivated to not let the Straw Hat slip away again. Still, I agree with Tekking 101, what makes no sense is spending all that effort to train superhumans and then not teaching them hockey. Now if you're new to my videos, with what ifs I always try to find a small, plausible change for that timeline that can set in motion the events of the greatest story we want to explore. For this story, I believe I'll be making just three. Number one of which being Rob Lucci at some point in this timeline before being deployed to Water 7 made multiple requests to send Goku or some high ranking navy official who could possibly carry it out to try and teach him the secrets of hockey. Much less the whole team, just him. How this happens doesn't really matter, maybe he fights a Logi at this time or something, but all that matters is that the character expresses a direct and powerful desire to obtain something his superiors canonically were presumably unwilling to give him or he was unable to do until he was given that promotion in canon. Number two, after the events of Eni's lobby, surviving an unnecessary buster call due to that idiot Spondum, and having to deal with neighbor pursuers, though it was pretty much just a single captain, as it was just very good with some other guys, and I don't know why you would do this, as all of CP9 pretty easily scale above all of these people, so it's kind of insulting. The point is, here in this timeline, CP9, or the former, don't feel anything for the Navy and Spondum except contempt to the point it will blind them to any semblance of joining back up in any capacity at any point in the future. And note, I can recognize this is the much more heavy handed change that I would make that is lacking a lot of nuance that I usually would have. And number three, which is an actual story change we get to see, coming at the very end of the battle against Luffy, just as Luchi is being pushed out of the tower and unconscious, he as well summons one more desperate attempt at stopping Luffy in this timeline and bites down one of the rubber man's fist with his hybrid form jaw. 
slowing down Luffy's jet Gatlin and allowing Luchi to begin digging his feet in and gaining ground back towards him. Luffy roars in pain and frustration as Luchi once again impedes him, but Luffy will not be conquered. This, earlier than in canon, causes a quick, near imperceptible eruption of the color of the Supreme King in our future Pirate King. And Luchi, in his tired state, is overwhelmed and recognizes in Luffy that same power of hockey I just mentioned to you that he wanted. And with that, we finally open our story. Now night in the open waters near their former homeland, and with the benefit of being in a navy vessel this time, the former CP9 crew celebrate by raiding the kitchen and eating better than they had for the past couple weeks due to their money troubles. Having all come to the decision they are done with the navy, they soon realize the time has come to find something to do with their lives once they get some mutually agreed upon payback against Spawn specifically. With Jabra piping up that they also need to rescue his pet rooster, there was no way he'd believe Luchi's avian companion survived and his died. Ignoring the overcompetitive Jabra, that is certainly an issue as growing up to be superhuman assassins could eat up a lot of job opportunities one could take, but it was fairly clear all had shown some form of ability to blend in and be casual for non-nefarious reasons. Caulifla alone, for instance, could easily go into business with some form of mobile cleaning service and cleanse whole islands for ridiculously high prices. Well, all in the crew had but Luchi due to his injuries. After he recovers though, he seems really contemplative and I wonder if that has something to do with how he currently views his teammates and himself and as well as where he wants to go from here. He was also characterized as being someone who views weakness as a sin and he even kills a new comrade for being too weak and all of them were too weak to stop the Straw Hats. He could really only blame their preparation and training at best and even that could only go so far. And I mean, it's the people he's been struggling with since he was a kid that have showed the most care and honestly a love for him. I think the code of honor we see Luchi kind of display in the Innie's Lobby arc would at the very least compel a sense of him owing his teammates his loyalty. As we speak though, the crew's eyes are all on him now. He'd long ago come to really seem like the true leader of their group giving his smaller group commands in Water 7 and were returning to the bigger group still seemed to hold that form of clout. They were all well aware what the path ahead of them was. It was just time for Rob Luigi, the man they chose as their captain, to speak it into being. Finally, as a celebratory meal hit an extremely loud octave due to Kumadori, Luigi would stand and cause Hattori to hop off his shoulder. With that ever serious look on his face softening only a tad, he'd grab his wine glass and would fill everyone's cup before proposing a toast and once again, or for the first time, extending a genuine thanks and show of gratitude in their saving of his life. Though now, if he was correct in assuming they all want some form of payback against Spondum, and with recognition of recent events, the bunch would all have decently high bounties posted in a week or so at most. By that point, it was the outlaw's life for them, and currently, something was telling him that the path to growing from his weakness is on the seas. What is this freedom that forced Luffy to fight so hard? He won't admit it, but that's also something he wants to discover. What else out there beyond killing for a system is there? What avenues were they cut off from by doing so? He wanted to know all of it, and on the way to those answers, he was sure they'd get the chance to knock some heads and satiate their various thirst for battle, and maybe even get a chance to redeem themselves against the future Pirate King and his crew. Speechless at the sincerity and openness Luchi just displayed, it was a hell of a way to be asked to be a pirate but they nonetheless erupt in cheers and begin celebrating excitedly once again, calling out their new dreams and aspirations, and even taking on new ship roles. Such as Kaku deciding he would genuinely like to continue being a shipwright, as it seemed to be something he enjoyed and expressed real remorse at being fired. Jabra jokes that that means the position of second in command or first mate was open and he'd be claiming that. It also meant that he and Luchi would have extra opportunities to train together and let him surpass the dumb leopard. And Kaku in the process actually. Luchi actually doesn't get upset about the insult this time, but states that all of them would need to do some serious growing before he asks Bluno what he'll do. The serious bullhead ponders it and decides he may as well expand on the skills he acquired undercover as a bartender. Him being the cook would have been better than Wanze's cooking any day anyway. Kumadori excitedly performs an overdramatic claim of the ship's musician spot. Fukuro, ever the jokester, didn't see why he shouldn't be the captain, only for Cauliflower to bonk him on the head, stating that he'll take the spot of scout slash infantry. With his love of gossip, he can easily spoil any approaching ship's attempts to attack them and his ability to gauge Doriki, he could actually go and crash into enemy ships and see how strong their fighters are before they actually fully engage them. 
Meanwhile, she, with a slight tick mark at the realization the person she lost to was the Straw Hat's navigator, she begrudgingly takes up the position, though to note she can't predict the weather like that brat could. And if anyone got mad at her for not being able to do so, she would call it sexual harassment. Just so I could get her catchphrase in the video as well. Also, while I have this chance, be sure you subscribe and leave a like, by the way. Also, did you know only 47.9% of Plus Ultraman viewers are subscribed? If you're in that other 52.1%, even if you think you aren't, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's pretty clear you guys love the content and we would love to have you part of our Nakama. Returning to our story, all that's left now is for our new crew to choose its name. And this is actually something I've been having a bit of trouble with, as I'm not really sure what this should be. One idea I've had is the Killing Machine Pirates, as there's a lot of things about Luchi that are referred to as Killing Machine. But I'm completely open to ideas and suggestions. The old Plus Ultra fam, this is where we'll be leaving the story off for right now. Hey guys, I know we were just getting into the really good stuff, but this part is already growing fairly long and I would like to gauge your interest in it before we go any further. I think a like goal of 2.5 thousand likes for a 50k special to span off of into sequel parts is pretty fair. And I'll make sure I'll put a pinned comment down there below just to make sure that everyone sees it. And from here on out, expect to see more One Piece centered stories crop up as we finish and start new ongoing stories. Now I owe a massive shout out to Rujindoru Jeff, aka Rujindoru Arts, a longtime fan and one of the first fan artists to ever contribute stuff to the community, as I commissioned him to mimic Oda's art style as he does it really, really well, and all the CP9 commissions you've seen in this video and some that you haven't seen yet, as well as the new One Piece style channel avatar. Rujindoru is really, really cool. Like Kobe that we also work with, he is also creating his own manga. So I very, 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 very highly encourage you guys to check his links in the description and please go and support his art directly. Remember, when you guys help out people that work with me to make content, everyone does better. Of course, in other visual credits, I also owe a thank you to people like Max Uchiha 22 and anyone else who may contribute video game and official character renders. Again, be sure to check out the description for a lot of cool stuff and links to all my social medias and such, and a special thank you as always to our amazing patrons. In Hero Tier, Lone Wolf McQuaid, Stefan Consprint, Superior, and Samuel Viveros. In Shinobi Tier, The True Black Star and Shannon Roberts. In Z Warrior Tier, Narku and Normandy1998. And Beyond Tier, Crimson Manifesto, Don, Pizza15X, and Knuckles OX. And in the Plus Ultra tier, DJ the Lazy Gamer, Zach Haji, and Zachary Hayes. Thanks for all your amazing support, as well as all those who have clicked the little join button and become channel members. P.S. to you guys, by the way, please stay tuned. Special member exclusive stickers and emojis are coming soon, I promise. But with that, I am done for this one, you guys. I hope you all enjoyed, and be sure to take care of yourselves and the world around you. Remember, Black Lives Matter, trans rights are human rights, and that I love you. And as always, go beyond plus ultra and see you guys next time.